Hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is Christy Kalavsky from the training department. Victoria Thomas is also on the call, as well as Lynn Wheeler, who's going to be kind of our go-to forms guru today. Uh, we're going to get started in just about uh, one or two more minutes, so hang tight, and uh, we'll kick it off here in just a sec. All righty, uh, according to my watch, it is 1.30 right on the nose. So for the sake of time, let's go ahead and get started this afternoon. So today's webinar is all about the COVID-19 forms changes that have been put out by IAR. So we wanted to have this uh, call today to make sure that you all knew what was out there, what has changed, what's available for you to use um, in order to be able to protect your clients. Um, and of course, just like any of our webinars, all of our attendees are muted. Um, we just do that to cut down on background noise. So if you could for me, take a minute right now just to go ahead and locate your questions panel. And then if you do have questions, you are able to type them in there. Victoria and I will be monitoring those questions throughout the webinar this afternoon. And um, we'll keep this as interactive as we can. So if it makes sense for us to kind of pause and address that question right away, we will, um, or if we need to get to it at the end, we may do that as well. Um, perfect, so let's kind of get right into it today. So like I said, um, we're gonna probably spend, we may not take the whole hour, but we've got an hour allotted to go through the COVID-19 forms changes from IAR. And for whatever reason, this system does not like to advance my slides when I click, okay. Cool, so here are the, just a quick overview, these are the three new forms that you have available to use. And one other quick note, I should have mentioned this first, uh, today's webinar is being recorded. Um, in addition to recording today's webinar, we will send out the slides because there are some links in here and some videos that are pretty interactive. And I wanna make sure that you guys have uh, full access to those links and you can kind of click through um, and get the information that you need. Um, so again, the three new forms from IAR, there is an addendum amendment to the purchase agreement, an addendum amendment to the listing contract, and then there is also a disclosure and waiver prior to physical showing or inspection. And um, we are going to get into sort of the nitty gritty here in just a second. But before we do, we want to make sure um, this is very, very important. Um, remember that these forms are recommended by IAR as well as our own FC Tucker legal counsel. Um, you do not have to use them and we'll kind of talk through that as we get into the forms, um, but there is some really, really great language in here that we do suggest you, um, you work with and you do use kind of basically verbatim. We don't want you guys kind of coming up with your own language. Um, that would not be so good. That's not approved by legal. Uh, so anyway, that's just kind of the, the big housekeeping stuff, and let's go ahead and get right into it. So Lynn, do you want to talk about the addendum amendment to the PA, what it is, and how to use it? Sure, and I just want to circle back real quick to our last slide for a second and just reiterate to people that even if you are doing what you're supposed to and not practicing law and not adding language to forms, I know... I've seen as a manager from our agents, and I'm sure all of you have seen, that there are some agents out there who may not have the training you have and may not have the expectations set that you do. And so we are seeing some agents who are getting creative and adding their own language into purchase agreements or documents that they come up with. Just play it safe. If you see any document like that, Get, in, get a hold of your manager before you sign it or present it to your client because we really shouldn't be not only creating those things ourselves, but we shouldn't be signing any of those things as someone is um, playing lawyer and adding language that hasn't been approved by an attorney. Okay, so going into the addendum amendment to the purchase agreement, this is the first form that IAR and, uh, and our brokerage as well has approved and has put out 
And I think it's important to kind of understand the backstory that this isn't just um, something that popped out of the air. Brokerages around the state, um, NAR, IAR have all collaborated and all gotten together to get forms that are um, really well orchestrated and really well reviewed so that these are forms that best serve all of our um, realtors across the city. So it's a great tool and it's a great collaboration that everybody should appreciate. Um, so this document is designed to serve the buyer and seller. It may seem a little vague. I think that's a point that a lot of people have brought up about this document in particular for the purchase agreement, but it's meant to address what if someone gets sick? What if a service provider, a lender, a title company gets sick or has something that causes a delay to the transaction that would make pushing things back necessary in the purchase agreement? And you know, there's a lot of what ifs with it. We don't know when someone's gonna get sick and we don't know how long they're going to be sick or we don't know how long there may be restrictions in place that would impede the ability to close a transaction. So it's vague by design. Uh, and there are some time frames that are in place. And if you read through this document, which we would recommend you read each of these documents extensively to understand them yourself. Uh, time frames are set basically 10 business days to a maximum of 30 days as an extension to the closing of a transaction. And anything beyond that 30 days much, must be mutually agreed upon between buyer and seller. And this is just something as a safeguard where if any of those parties become sick or the transaction has to be delayed, those automatic extensions are agreed to by both parties up front. Um, I think it's important, Christy, you mentioned this a minute ago, it's recommended you use this form. If your buyer or seller are not comfortable with it, if they don't like the vagueness of it in a transaction, you absolutely don't have to use this form. Don't lose a deal over it. It's something that can be addressed by an amendment to the purchase agreement at the time that someone would become sick or that a delay would become present that would impede people from closing a transaction. So you can absolutely use an amendment later on if something arises, but the state attorneys and our company is recommending this for use if your buyer and seller agree to move forward with it. And um, that was super helpful. And I actually have a question for you kind of just with your manager hat on. I had a transaction um, recently and it was multiple offers. And one of the offers did come in with this um, amendment and it was, kind of interesting for me and I, I tried to explain it to my client the best I could my seller as to why um, the buyer wanted to use that but you know help us out here like what are some talking points that we could share um, I sort of told my client I was surprised I it didn't come in on all offers but it's very common right now this is a lot of just been talked about in our industry very very much as a protection on both sides anything else you might suggest um, explaining to like a seller, for example, when they do receive an offer that has this, because it, it's a little scary and it's, they, they've noticed the same thing. They're like, this is really vague. So that's a really, really awesome point. And expectation is everything. And we preach that all the time in the normal world, right? You have to set the expectation for your buyer and seller. So don't wait even until you receive an offer. Don't wait until you're making an offer with a buyer or a seller. Go over this form prior to. Now, have that conversation with them about, hey, this is kind of an unusual world we're in right now, and there have been some forms created to try to safeguard buyers and sellers against that. So have that conversation now, show them the form, make them familiar with it, and let them know that if they're selling their home, they may receive some offers that have this form attached. And if they're making a purchase agreement, they may feel more comfortable utilizing this form or they don't want to, and that's okay, like we said. Um, in your situation, Christy, in particular with multiple offers, I think with my manager hat on and my realtor hat on, I'd recommend to people to not make an assumption, not completely rule an offer out because this form's attached and a seller's uncomfortable with it. Mm -hmm. Look at the offers in front of you as you know what's best for the seller given the terms and the things that are written into those agreements and the financing and the contingencies that are that exist for those offers 
And if something like this is attached that bothers your seller and they don't want to utilize it, we've learned over the past 30 days, the most valuable thing you can do in real estate that we never do is pick up the phone and have a conversation. So pick up the phone, call that agent, explain that your seller really likes their offer but is uncomfortable with this document and see how the buyer feels about that and if they're willing to move forward in the transaction without it. Just have a conversation and talk it through. I absolutely love that. Awesome. Victoria, did you happen to see any questions that came in regarding uh, this amendment addendum to the purchase agreement that we should make sure that we address right now? Nope, nothing yet. Okay. Awesome. All right, let's move on to um, similar form, but this is an addendum amendment to the listing contract. So this is a whole world of change right now with COVID. The way that we have traditionally marketed properties is changing on a daily basis. And um, in the current listing contract, there are many obligations spelled out for the realtor of how they're going to market a property on behalf of the seller. And that's part of your fiduciary responsibility and the responsibility that you enter into when marketing a property. So this form is really important. I would say out of all the forms that we've put forward, this is the one that I would probably recommend the most, uh, just because it really spells out what your expectation is as the realtor of how you are marketing of the property may change based on the seller's wishes. And it puts that in writing, which we all know as realtors who do their jobs well, it's really important to have things in writing so there's nothing unclear. So this is a great document where if you have a current listing that it is not in place, or if you have a listing that you're getting ready to put on the market, I would have the conversation with the seller regarding this document and set the expectation of how you're going to market the property. And what it does is it states in writing uh, what is going to be the seller's preference. Are they going to allow traditional showings to continue? It gives them a recommendation if they do allow that to you know, safeguard their home, make sure that they're showing their home in a way that makes them feel comfortable with possibly gloves or hand sanitizer or booties provided, not overlapping showings, things like that. Uh, and then it also gives them the option to select that they would not like showings to continue and um, that possibly virtual showings would be an option. And we'll go through that in a second as an other option but they're gonna select as a seller whether or not they authorize you to do traditional showings on their home or not have people come through their home at this time for traditional showings because they're not comfortable with it. Um, finally, it affirms uh, protection to us as a broker. You'll see the bottom clause of this agreement is a hold harmless clause that if the seller elects to have showings, we're protected and you're protected as an agent that that's their choice and they need to do that in a way that they're comfortable. So I love that part of it because what we don't want is for a seller to move forward with showings, have someone get sick and then come back and pass um, you know, the finger to us as their agent for telling them to do that. They're making the choice. I love that. Okay, so one part that's really awesome, and this came from our Zionsville office as a suggestion, uh, is language that you can add in to the other section of this agreement. And that language basically states that the seller authorizes the use of virtual showings conducted by the listing agent whenever possible uh, as a first time showing. They may choose that that's all they want and that's okay, but the governor came out with an update to their recommendations yesterday for real estate as an essential service. And I'm sure all of you saw this. It's a really important update where the governor really mandated that he wanted all real estate services to be conducted virtually whenever possible. So a virtual showing really should be the first option for showing any property if possible to keep everybody safe, the seller and the buyer. If you're listing a home, go and have either a service or yourself take a video of that listing right off the bat so that you have a virtual video showing available and people can see it in that manner. 
I know we had an agent last week list a property and within 20 minutes, she had an accepted offer by someone who had viewed the home via the virtual showing and written an offer right away. So they work and people are comfortable with them most of the time, but you need to be prepared. Um, this language showing that the seller wants to uh, show the home virtually was approved by our legal counsel. So you're not playing lawyer if you insert it in the other section of this agreement, but it gives the seller another option for showing the property on this form, which is a great option to insert. I love that, awesome. All right, and we have a video here to kind of walk through the different options that your clients uh, have available to them. Lynn actually put this together for the Keystone office uh, last week, I think, and I thought it was super helpful. So tune in. Option one is to list a home traditionally. So you can do normal showings and list a house just like you normally would. Just take precautions to be as safe as possible. And you can find those precautions linked in the four o'clock from IAR and leaving our with suggestions of how to practice safe business. Option two is to do virtual showings. And if you would like to do this option, we recommend you ask the seller to take a video or you yourself can video the home as a tour of the listing. Staff will guide you through how to upload that video to YouTube or Facebook to promote that listing. We recommend you add a note to agent to agent remarks saying that a virtual showing is available and add a note in showing time. Your seller can choose to show them traditionally and offer a virtual showing, or they can do virtual showings only. Please excuse the Nerf gun. That was the only prop we had that looked like a video key. Option number three is temporary market. If your seller is uncomfortable with doing showings during a time of COVID-19, you can take a home temporarily off market. To do that, you just need to do an amendment to the listing contract, listing the dates the home will be off market, and the dates on market will stop on the VLC, and the home will not be syndicated to third party sites. Most important thing with this is there are no showings, period, when a home is temporarily off market. And option four is a new option from my order, and this is that the self is not comfortable with showings, but they still want promote their home on the VLC and third party sites, they can do a new uh, temporary status of no showing. And to do this, their home will remain on the VLC and the day by market count will continue. A note must be added to agent to agent remarks saying that the seller will no longer accept showings during to Due to COVID-19, there is language that's recommended by my board in the document linked below. And the seller must complete a my board temporary suspension of showings form. Most importantly, again, is an EQ. No showings are allowed during this time. We hope to you guys, and if you decide how to show your listings during this time, have a great and safe day. Love that. Great video, Lynn. So it, a couple of documents are attached to that video, just so you guys have the information that you need for moving forward. The recommendations that we noted from Leading RE uh, for showings for sellers and for buyers are attached there. You may have noticed the marketing department for Tucker put out a awesome graphic this week with similar recommendations. So that's a great one to share with your sellers and buyers. And then uh, the temporarily off market form that we mentioned from my board is linked there. And you can use that for homes that are temporarily off market, uh, completely not allowing showings. You can also use that form for homes that will stay active on the VLC but not allow showings at all. It's required uh, for that particular instance, but I use it for both. 
It's a great form because it notes when the seller is ready to go back on market, they sign and denote their, um, their ability to move forward and be marketed again on that same form. So it's a great form to use. Awesome. And like I said, you guys will have this presentation so you can uh, click directly into those links. Um, Victoria, do we have any questions that came in regarding um, the listing contract or showings? I had a feeling we might have some questions there because I know we just covered a lot. So I want to pause and, and just see if there's anything we need to address now. Yeah, I had a question about um, what about adding language allowing the seller to conduct the virtual tour? That's fine. If they would like to do that, I mean, there's no language in this for that, but you could absolutely um, put a notation on the form saying the seller will create the, the virtual tour or the virtual showing. I think the key here is what's easiest for your seller and for potential buyers. And it's probably going to be um, more of a less stressful process if one video is done and shared over and over again rather than doing a showing virtually every single time you have a request and so what we're seeing people do a lot is take that video or have the seller take that video which is totally acceptable and then upload that video to youtube uh, which we're happy to share instructions for that as well it's a very easy process and then you can share that link to the showing to anyone who requests it through showing time or the BLC. You should put an agent to agent remarks and on showing time if you have a virtual showing available that it is available and people should reach out to get a copy of it from you. Uh, you could also promote that via Facebook as a marketing opportunity for the seller. Uh, but taking one video is gonna be easiest and trackable rather than doing a FaceTime or something that you do every single time you get a showing request. And that's an excellent point, Lynn. I was going to mention the same thing. The nice thing about utilizing a service like YouTube to post it, A, it's free, but B, you know, you'll see how many times it was viewed, which can be super helpful, not only for you as the agent, but for your seller as well. Anything else, Victoria? Nope, I think we're good. Okie dokie. Form number three, disclosure and waiver prior to showing slash inspection. So this is one you guys might not be as familiar with, and it is a form that came out last week, uh, right around the same time as the listing amendment and the, uh, the purchase agreement addendum. And this is basically a waiver for anyone who is going to show the property in person. And it accomplishes a few things. So we'll, we'll talk about this. Uh, the most important thing I would say, just as a disclosure to all of these forms, but most importantly, this particular form, is you have to be really, really careful, guys, to make sure that you're treating everyone equally when using these forms. So specifically, this disclosure, if you're going to require it or your seller is asking this to be required to be completed by anyone who shows the home, it needs to be anyone and everyone. If you uh, rule someone out as needing to fill out this form, there could be opportunities or a possibility for that person to have some sort of discrimination uh, clause against you. So you want to be really careful to not discriminate or appear to discriminate by only having certain groups fill this out, have every single person do it before showing the home. Uh, so a couple things this does is it adds an agreement to the buyer viewing the property at their own risk. So the buyer is affirming in writing that they're okay seeing a home in person with the current health issues, and they're gonna take the precautions necessary to protect themselves, okay? It also adds the expectation that the buyer's agent take every precaution when they're showing the home. Um, and sellers should communicate any additional expectations that they have via showing instructions on showing time. If the seller wants no overlapping appointments, for example, that's really popular right now and a great, great suggestion to protect people for appointments, uh, they should communicate that for, via showing time. If the seller wants buyers to wear booties or gloves or anything like that, that should be on the showing instructions for the home. Set the expectation. Um, it also gives the expectation in writing 
that the buyer and the broker and the seller inform the broker if any party should develop symptoms or become sick. That is so important because it requires the seller and the buyer's agent and the buyer to inform you of that in writing. And that is a really great protection for you as the agent, but also your client as the seller or the buyer as they're walking through a home, just to protect everybody for full disclosure. Um, there's a great question and answer document that we're gonna go over in a minute from the state. And one particular question that was asked regarding this document is, uh, are you required to disclose if a seller was sick prior, but they've recovered? And the answer is no, because they're not actively sick. But this form really, really helps because it puts everything in writing on requirements for disclosures for parties as they become sick, if that's okay. Uh, finally, it adds a protection again, or a hold harmless to you as the broker that you know, your seller is showing the property at their own risk and the buyer is viewing the property at their own risk, you're not liable for any health concerns that may arise because of these showings. Oops, sorry, having slide issues there. Awesome. Any questions about this particular form? And right now, Lynn, the best way for our agents to get access to this one is to go through their manager, is that correct? Very good point. So this form is actually available on zip forms. So oh, awesome. it is a form that is on zip forms. I just confirmed this morning that it's there and available if you search for it. It is not yet on dot loop. So if you would like this form, you can ask your manager or you can go on the zip forms account through the state and look for it that way. And then if you want to utilize it, if your seller really wants this utilized for any showings, Probably the easiest way to do that is put a notation on broker to broker remarks on the BLC saying that this form is required to be signed prior to any showing. And you can even attach it as a supplemental on the BLC or send it to each individual agent as they set up a showing. That would be my preference because then you again can pick up the phone, have a conversation, set the expectation of why the seller wants this signed and remind the broker who's showing the property that every party is signing this and just get to know them and have a good conversation because you wanna have a good working relationship with someone who might sell your house. Yep, awesome, thank you. Okay, um, here is basically the document and then a link to the full form for that from IAR, it's the legal uh, sort of FAQs. We mentioned a few of them today, so would highly recommend um, that you take a peek at this form when, or when you have it, have time and, and just kind of get yourself um, feeling a little bit more comfortable. This is a great document and it's hot off the press. It just came out yesterday. So uh, it, the, the IAR attorney, Send it right to me for requests. So I'm pretty sure not very many people, if anybody has seen this yet, and it should come out from the state, I would imagine today or tomorrow, uh, but it is a great document. It goes through all sorts of questions and answers related to COVID from inspections to, um, it, you know, disclosure, if someone gets sick, all of those. So I'd highly recommend you read this. If there's any follow-up questions that you have, that aren't answered here that your manager or someone in the company can answer for you. There is an IAR legal hotline. And of course we have a great resource here at the company that we can call and ask follow-up questions for you. So if you have something that's just kind of a burning question reading through this, ask your manager and ask them if maybe they check in with the state or, uh, or our resources here at the company to get an answer for you. We are all here to help. Just because we're not in the offices doesn't mean we're not working. All of the company's staff and managers and agents are working from home and here to help all of you. So ask the questions and we'll get you an answer. Awesome, thanks Lynn. Just a little bit more of that document. And then finally, just a couple other resources that we wanted to share. Um, the, there's the NAR link for um, all of the documents related to the coronavirus that you guys can kind of um, review and dig into. And um, yeah, there's just some really good stuff out there. It is changing daily, so keep your eye on it. 
and we will do our best to continue to make sure that we put classes like this together um, so you guys are kept up to speed. Any other questions that came in, Victoria? This out today, but the NIR resources are updated daily. It's awesome. That website that's there kind of has a link to everything from information on business practices to um, the CARES Act, which was just passed, and how realtors might fall into that. And I know you linked today, there's a webinar or a Facebook Live event at one o'clock tomorrow put on by NAR that's going to go all into that uh, CARES Act and how it affects realtors. So that'd be a really great thing for people to tune into and learn what they may qualify for or have as resources during this time. Excellent point. And that you guys should have received an email from NAR with that information, but it's also on the Tucker Training Facebook group page. Any questions, Ms. Victoria? Yeah, I just had uh, one come in about that last document that you guys went over. Um, even if you, if the agent doesn't currently have a transaction, should they go ahead and have their buyer sign that form? Um, no, that form, as far as the disclosure, is that what they're talking about? Yeah, I think so. So the disclosure, basically, it, you're going to see that as something that's passed on for um, sellers as they mandate people sign it before they view homes. That's actually a good point where I guess you could have a buyer sign it stating that they understand the risk of seeing a home in person. I believe that it has a seller and buyer signature on it. And so it's meant purposely for a seller and buyer as a disclosure trying to see a listing. But let me ask on that for you. I, I would see no harm in a buyer signing it just so it's in writing that they understand the concerns of possibly seeing a house in person. Yeah, that's a really good question. Anything else as we wrap up? There was kind of a follow-up to that. Um, she also asked, you know, how are we protected if the buyer views the property and gets sick? Um, does that go back to that hold harmless piece of information? It would, it's a really good point. Awesome, and I think, you know, Lynn said it earlier on, but I think the key with all of this is just setting really good expectations, talking to our buyers now or our sellers now before they're either on the market or they're out looking at homes. It's a really great point just to make sure that they know that there are some protections out there, um, but at the end of the day, they just need to do what they're most comfortable with. And if that means waiting, that means waiting. Exactly. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for joining today. Hopefully this was helpful. Um, we will share this. It will be emailed out from the Tucker Training Gmail account. Um, so look for that. Feel free to um, pass along within your offices or on your teams and definitely give us a shout if you have any other questions regarding any of this. And we hope to have lots of you on the call uh, tomorrow with NAR. Awesome. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Victoria. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Christy. Yep.